Just to the right, to the back, and the front. Jesus loves you. Why don't we all greet each other once more? Happy Sunday! It's uh, such a great time to be with you all. Um, just to just just to uh, add on um, a little bit more on the uh, announcements for the retreat. So a packing list will be sent to you guys today. Uh, just to let you know, for those of you who are going to the retreat, those of you who aren't, please join us next year. Uh, not next year, but this winter. Uh, it's going to be such an awesome time to share fellowship with one another, but also with the Lord. Um, yeah, so if you miss out this year, please, there's also one in the winter, so please look out for that. Just to let you guys know, if anything else, those of you who are going to the retreat, please, 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 please bring your Bible. The Bible is a must. It has been personally requested by the speaker as well, because we will be looking throughout, like, literally, like, packets of the Bible um, during the retreat, uh, especially during the night uh, worship as well. So please bring your Bible, just to add a little, uh, a few more in there, there's a sleeping bags and pillows, I mean, if you need, um, personal water bottle as well, personal water bottle, so that you can just fill the cup like that instead of, you know, just drinking a sip of a bottle and just throwing out the rest, because we don't know whose that is. So please bring your own personal water bottle. Um, there is a pool, and there's pool time, so please bring your swimsuits as well, and a big towel, like a you know, pool towel as well. One thing that I do want to mention, though, is please, especially for the ladies, please do not bring your bikinis. Uh, if you do, please just, you know, during pool time, just wear like a long shirt or something of similar sort. Um, shower shoes as well, pajamas and slippers to wear inside the cabin. Tennis shoes for outdoor activities, towels uh, for shower and swimming, of course, and then uh, personal toiletry items. As I know that some will probably be bring like a huge shampoo bottle. So, uh, you know, I know I'm not bringing mine because I'm just going to borrow someone who brought, brings like a big one. Uh, but if you, know, you know, if you do have your own personal ones that you must use like a certain brand or whatnot, please bring those. Um, so yeah, they will all be posted to you guys, sent out through their youth group chat as well, so please be on the lookout for that as well. So once again, please get together by 10 a.m. this Wednesday, and we will be departing here by 11. Uh, sounds good? All right, let's look into the word of the Lord, First Thessalonians chapter 4. First Thessalonians chapter 4. So it's in the New Testament. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 to 18. If you have your Bible, it should be on page, in the New Testament, page 332. 332 in the New Testament. Oh, before we begin, I believe that there are newcomers, right? I should introduce newcomers first. Uh, I believe that we have two newcomers, right? There is uh, Chloe Park. Chloe Park, who's Chloe Park here? Where are you, Chloe Park? Oh, is that you? Can you please stand up? Yeah, let's all give her a warm welcome. A positive welcome, yes. And then also, Soan Ma. Soan Ma is there? Oh, yes, hi. Please give her a warm welcome. A positive welcome, yes. Glad to have you guys with us. Join us. Welcome to Servant uh, Sync Youth. It's called Servant Youth in Christ. Uh, and we're just so glad to have you guys together and worship with us. Um, <clears throat> So let me just pray for our new sisters who joined us in worship, and we'll dive into the word of the Lord. Um, Father, we thank you, God, uh, to be able to just praise you, to worship you in this uh, beautiful day, Lord. We also thank you uh, for bringing uh, Chloe and so on into our lives, Lord, to be able to just praise you together. And I pray, God, Father, that uh, through their praise as well as ours, may you always be glorified all the more. We're excited to look into the word of the Lord, and may it just be the word that just uh, feeds us uh, and feeds our spirit, Lord. So we thank you, and we pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. So 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 to 18. Verses 13 to 18. So it's a couple of verses, so please follow along as I read it. Brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death, so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again. And so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in Him. According to the words of the Lord's word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede 
those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, archangel and with the trumpet of call of God. And the death in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive oops, and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. Amen. So today I'll be sharing about we wait with hope. We wait with hope. So let me ask you guys a question. Have there ever been a moment in your life where your parents, you were just doing something, and then, you know, you're just doing something, I don't know, mich- mischievous. I don't know, you were, like getting, like, getting ready to blow up a firecracker or something, and then you just got caught. Or is there anything that caught you unprepared? Let's say, you know, you're during school, you had to do a presentation, but you completely forgot about it, and all of a sudden, the teacher calls your name first with nothing prepared for that. So how does it feel? How would it feel if you were caught doing something or that you have to do something, but you're still unprepared for it? Now, compared to that, how would you feel if you were prepared for something? How would you feel if you were actually prepared? Let's say you had to do a public speaking, and then, you know, you know that it's your turn next, and you're just ready, you're pumped, you have all your uh, um, cue cards uh, ready, all in order, to prepare as best as you can, and you're just revving to go. How does that make you feel? Does it still make you feel better? Or does it still make you feel a little nervous? Maybe nervous for some, maybe a little better for some uh, others, but one thing that we do know is that being prepared is always better than being unprepared. For exams, it's always better to be prepared rather than unprepared. Let's say you have a whole day of doing whatever you want, and all of a sudden your parents told you, hey, we have this going on today, and you're just completely unprepared for that. It's always better to be prepared for things to come and for things that will happen in your life. Now, of course, on the same time, if, let's say, it's your birthday, and, you know, nobody says anything about it, and then they just decide to surprise you. There's also that element of excitement as well. Surprises can be really fun if what we receive is positive. But if the outcome is negative, you know, most of us would like to prepare for the worst. Or at the very least, be prepared for it mentally and emotionally. Now, that is because a lot of the time, humans throughout all history always like to be prepared so that they don't get caught off guard, so that they don't get caught by surprise, just out of the blue. Now, as, as believers, as Christians, as those who believe in Christ, as those who believe in the gospel, there's also something that we must prepare for all, for, that we must prepare for throughout our whole life. Anybody care to guess what that is? I remember I shared this in, during like uh, January and I think early Feb. There's something that all Christians are called to prepare for. That all believers must wait for this happening. And that is Christ's return. The return of Christ. Christ will come back. And when he comes back, he is coming back fully prepared and fully ready to distinguish those who have repented and accepted our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and those who haven't, those who are living as if Jesus is coming back, and those between those who aren't waiting for Jesus to come back. And now, if anything else, it's going to be the moment where it is between life everlasting or death everlasting. The moment when Jesus is coming. And while we're at it, we don't want to be caught off on guard, uh, off guard. And so what I want to say is that in order for us to be prepared, in order for us to be ready for Jesus' coming, there is something that God has given us so that we may be fully equipped and ready. And that is the word of the Lord. That is the gospel. It is the knowledge that Jesus is coming back and that even though things may seem unfavorable, even though things may seem uncomfortable or it may be good, even though death seems undesirable, that is still not the end. Okay? And this knowledge should alter everything about the way we live. 
The way we live should dictate, should express what we know and what we believe in, which is the return of Christ. The believers, if we look in today's scripture in the Thessalonians, in the letter of Thessalonians, the believers in Thessalonica, so it's the church. So Paul was writing in the, in the letter of Thessalonians, a letter to the church in Thessalonica, because they were struggling with many things, with believers who had passed away, who died, and whether they would go to heaven or not. You know, what would happen if Jesus Christ comes back? So it was a period where, you know, they were really waiting. They were hoping that Jesus Christ would come back while they were still alive here in this world like we are. But what about those who just passed away? Even though they believed in the gospel. Now the problem here is that the church in Thessalonica had a very big issue. And that is, instead of following the scripture, following the holy life, following the Christian life, the God that Jesus had taught them. What happened was there were false teachers appearing here and there trying to disrupt the church of Jesus Christ. And then they start to listen to them. The, the church members of, of Thessalonica, Thessalonica start to listen to them, which caused more confusion. So they're like, wait, so the Bible says this, but also we believe in this, and also this person says this, and they all make sense in a certain way, but some part it's not matching with the Bible. And so there was a huge confusion. And so Paul, being a scholarly expert and a very devoted man to Christ, and who wrote 13 of the 27 books in the New Testament, who experienced Jesus physically through a blinding light and an actual audible voice, he assured them. He was writing a message to them saying, hey, it's okay, Thessalonians, you know, you don't, it, it's okay. Once you believe in Christ, once you believe in his return, it's okay, just calm down. And that whatever that you're still doing for Christ, whatever that you were doing, that was good. Keep continuing doing that. And now this is what he was doing. He was, a rem he was reminding them, and also he was re reminding us, saying, hey, even though we may die, before Christ returns, even though our body may die before the second coming of Jesus Christ in this actual physical world, which that is what the gospel is about. He is physically going to come back to this world. And even if people have already died and passed on, <coughs> and that they should grieve, and that they grieve, it's, it, their grief it's okay to shed tears and to be, you know, in sorrow mode. But on the same time that their grief should be wrapped up in hope. That anything and everything that we do, we have to do it in Christ. Believing in Christ. In the hope of Jesus coming, Jesus coming again. So even in the grief, they must believe in hope. That death isn't the final. It isn't the end. Our physical body isn't the end. And that we will be reunited with those who already moved on in life. I'm sure we have family members, relatives, possibly grandparents, uh, uh, grandparents who've moved on in life. But we miss them. But if there's anything that I want you guys to remember is this. Their death is not the end. Although it may be the last time we see him, them in this physical world, this physical form, and with our physical eyes, but it's not the end. For we will be reunited with them and with Christ once we go to heaven. But the sad part is, if we don't go to heaven, we'll be forever uh, cast away from them. Yes, lonely. But why does death feel so final to us? Why does death feel so final? Why does it, why does it feel as if, hey, we just need to live and live our best until we die? Why does it seem like that? I remember my, one of my friends during... Um, uh, from elementary, middle school, and high school, actually, until middle school, there was a friend called Joel Gagnon. Um, he's a friend from uh, elementary all the way until middle school, and then somehow we just parted ways. And I remember he mentioned this. He wasn't by any means a Christian. I, I'm, I don't know if he is right now or not. But I remember he said a very insightful thing that really caught my attention. What he said was, you know, the life that we're living here, it's like a practice to how God wants us to live in heaven. And although it's not like, like 
like in full detail and in depth, it made me realize that, hey, maybe that could possibly be it. What we're trying to live here is, are we living, in a, uh, are we living a life in which that shows that we really want to live in heaven? That we really want to live as if, as if we're living in heaven? If so, then we must learn to realize that death isn't final, that death isn't the end. That even though families, friends, and just peers and people that we know, or not, personally, have moved on in this life, that their physical body has died, we must still wait with hope. Now, it's hard to completely explain what the death of someone you love feels like. Uh, one minute, the, uh, this person is there, and you talk with them, you can hug them, you can just spend some great quality time with them, and then all of a sudden, because their physical body has died, they're, they're gone. And it feels painful, and as if it's the last time we'll see them. Because that is, you know, that is how it feels. Because, you know, we can no longer see them, hear them, touch them, feel them, just feel their presence. And so it leaves like a gaping void. Um, and that is why it's all the more important for us to be able to live a life in preparation for the second coming of Christ, but also, not only that, live a life where we are also preparing to meet our loved ones again so as long as we meet them in heaven. So as long as we meet them in heaven. And to do that, we have to wait with hope. Live with hope. We must acknowledge that it's healthy and necessary to, though while we grieve and feel sorrow, we must do it in a healthy way when we lose someone, with faith. Not only did God who created us with love and deep sorrow and grief for us to be able to experience those things. But while he created us, he also understands when we go through them. He feels our grief. And he feels compassion for each and every one of us. Now, so what's the difference between those who grieve with hope and those who grieve without hope? This is the main message that I would like to share today. What is the difference when we grieve with hope and when we grieve with no hope. When family members, when friends, you know, we go our own way or they move on into the next life, they die and we're just left alone. What's the difference with those who still have hope and those who don't? While grief may look differently from each person, you know, we may act, react in different ways. I don't know, some of us may just try to close ourselves away from people. Some of us may just start trying to eat a lot, as much food as we can just to, as a coping mechanism. Some of us may start showing Certain emotions, especially like anger or, or, or deep sorrow to the point of depression, um, as a way that, uh, that's reactionary to this event. Now, while it may be all different, and even those, you know, who aren't struggling as much, we can still feel sadness, and that sadness can be reacting in different ways. Um, there are ways that we can always grieve well. And as Christians, we can grieve well through Jesus. We can grieve with sorrow while still knowing and trusting that God is good and he is good in his promise. And what is the promise that he has set for us? That we will all be reunited for as long as we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior and that we repent of our sins. That is how we can grieve well. Believing that we can all be reunited. That is grieving through Jesus. Knowing and trusting that God is a God who holds, upholds his promise, who never goes back on his promise, and who's always good in his promise, and his promise is always good for us. Now the key to this is that we must believe that death isn't final. That it's not the end. So long as we believe in Jesus. The gospel tells us to have hope even in death. Because to live the, leave this world means we are truly reunited with our loved ones and, most importantly, God and Jesus Christ. Now, Paul was sharing this message to the church in Thessalonica, to the theologi uh, Thess Thessalonians. He was sharing this message because what happened to the church members in Thessalonica is that they started to lose hope. Their actions, their lives, the way they spoke, the way they held themselves, the way they carried themselves, start to act, show that they did not believe in Christ. 
Some would leave church. Some would not serve the church. Some would not worship when it's a time of worship. Some would hold back on prayer when clearly they need to pray. And that is why Paul was telling them, hey, you got to wake up, you know. He encouraged and, and decided to give a message of hope to the Thessalonians, right? but he followed with a strong reminder, a strong reminder. He said, be self-controlled, be self-controlled in today's scripture. In other words, he encouraged believers to live as if eternity were a breath away, as if it's a breath away. Whatever that we're going through right now, though temporary, don't act as if it's eternal. But rather, what may seem uh, um, seem impossible is eternal and is possible through God. And that is what we should have. That's how we live in a self-controlled way, in a holy, holistic self-controlled way. He cautioned the Thess- Thessalonians to live as children of hope as children of God, and to make the most of their time here on earth by pointing others to Christ in the way that they are living. And that is how we live a self-controlled life. Live a life. Make the most of your time here on earth by pointing others to Christ. Make your life show Christ. So how do we do that? How do we do that? The question I think we can all ask each other is, what would Jesus do? What would Jesus do in this list? What glorifies Christ? What can glorify Christ in this next action? And so that brings hope. That the expectation of Christ's return brings us hope. Hope isn't just for hope's sake. Hope is a good word. It's a, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a positive word. It's a very attractive word, um, to the point that even, you know, it's it's used as like a, a name for girls, especially like baby girls. Um, but hope isn't just for the sake of hope. We're not just saying the word hope, have hope, you know, get get hope just for the sake of that, just for the sake of you making yourself feel good. But real hope, when you have real hope within you, it produces change. In us. In what way? In a Christ like way. If what we hope for is true, then in faith we must live drastically different from the world and from whom we were before knowing Jesus. That is what it means to have real hope, not fake hope like the world is trying to teach us. We must live according to God's words. And his standards rather than the world's standards. And we must use our time here to show others this hope through the word appearing in our life. Our actions, our words, and the way we love people. Are there areas in your life in which you've gotten spiritually away from God? Have hope. Hope. And let that hope bring you back, spiritually back to God. If we're, and one of the things that casts us away, spiritually away from God, is this. If we're not spiritually alert, it's easy to get comfortable in where we stand. And I want to say this, even, you know, not just um, in general as well, but even those who are going to retreat and who are going to missions. We're not going there because, you know, we're like the, the big boys and the big girls. You know, we're not going there because, you know, we're all that. Although we try our best to prepare ourselves to be that person to the best that we can. Even in retreat, once you're done, you know, don't idolize retreat as if it's some great, amazing thing, but rather go out in hope. Go to retreat with hope that Jesus is there, that Jesus is real. If not, we end up losing our spiritual awareness as it's easy to get comfortable in where we stand. And as a result, without us knowing, we end up becoming further, further, and further away from Christ, from God. It's easy to forget that we aren't really made for this world, this sinful, sinful world. And so we become unable to steward our life for God in a proper manner. And then we, start to, we begin to slip and fall in many places in our, in our lives. And possibly... We may have stopped and slipped from 
hearing the word of the Lord. Maybe you just started doing something that, you know, that takes you away from God. Maybe you start to compromise and start looking at things that cast you away from God without knowing that it does. And to this, Paul says this. He's actually, instead of, what do you call that? Like punishing, saying a word of, like, you know, punishment. But he, rather, he said he encourages the believers in Thessalonica. God is encouraging us. Although we may have slipped away from God spiritually, God is still encouraging us through the word of Paul, through today's passage. So, and, that, and what he's telling us is to stand firm. Stand firm. Stand firm in what? Stand firm in God's truth. In God's truth. We must be rooted in his truth no matter what may be happening around us, to us, or even just our, the, the place that we're living in, to those who are near us. You must be rooted in this church no matter, the, no matter the opposition, no matter how strong the opposition is. Which We must be rooted in this church because it enables us to stand firm and strong. And when we navigate through today's culture, even in our church, we must center around His Word. And so I'd like to end it with this, guys, if anything else. Live a life with hope. Hope that Jesus Christ will return. Live a life with hope, knowing that Christ's return should change our life. Real hope should produce holistic change in us, Christ-like change in us. With a lot of information going around, going through our brain, you know, let alone just passing by us, a lot of information going through our brain, especially with social media and all, it's difficult to discern truth from lies. It's, it has become difficult to distinguish truth from lies. Even I myself as a pastor, if I'm not careful, it's sometimes there will be lies that may sound like a truth and I'll just accept it as a truth. If we're not careful, that's how much, uh, you know, a lot of information, truth and false, are just being, you know, intertwined in social media so that the truth may be blended in as uh, lies may be blended in with truth so that it may sound like it's true. It may confuse us. It may tempt us. And it may be tempting us to follow the crowd and agree with whatever the majority you're around because having a different view from others is difficult. But if anything else, it's not about who's right and who's wrong, but it's about is it from God? Is it from God? And if we don't stand with God because we would rather blend in, we have no, it leads us to stepping away from God. And how then can we stand firm in something that we don't know? Standing firm comes when we both get into God's words and to strive to consistently obey it. And that is what waiting in hope means, to obey the word of the Lord. When you, when you wait on God, it's not just simply you just stand still and that's it. It's not you just lie down in your bed and wait for something to spark to happen. No. It's to go out in obedience to the word that he has, he has given us through the scripture. And that is what I want to bless you with tonight. That is what I want to encourage you guys. And that is the hope and expectation that I hope all of you guys can have, especially for this retreat. Believe and know. Be ready to receive his words, his instructions, his guidance in a way that we can live while we wait and hope for the return of Jesus Christ. That is the Lord in whom we worship and whom we praise. Let us pray. Let's take this moment and pray before the Lord. Time's been a little bit past, so we will skip the response worship, and I'll just um, go to prayer and end it with a benediction. Do we have like a soft uh, music in the background as I pray? So, yes, let us all pray before the Lord. Father, we thank you, God. I thank you, Lord, for all things that we do. It's always about you, Jesus. It's always about you. And I know that although the world may be tempting us to stand away from you, to get away from you, and with so much things that's happening in, 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 in the culture of the world, Lord, I pray that you would help us find a deeper level of discernment so that we can uh, faithfully and truthfully stand by your words. And although it may seem as if, you know, we may be left alone, it may, see, it may, it may seem as if, you know, uh, we're going to be left alone and where the, the crowd just moves away, 
that's still okay. Help us to have confidence in you. Help us to find complete joy and fulfillment in you. Because knowing, uh, knowing you, Lord, it is better to have you and you alone than to have the world. That is the faith that we want, Lord. That is the heart that we so desire. And so bless each and every one of us as we go out to that, Lord. We thank you, Lord. And we all pray in the name of Jesus Christ. And we all say, Amen. Let's end the service with a benediction. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God our Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with each and every one of us forever and ever. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Uh, yes, uh, please be seated. Uh, just one last thing that I wanted to share. Sorry, I should have shared this at the beginning. Um,